One of the most difficult things I think to learn to gain a piece of knowledge in uh, in the field of numismatics is currency. And we have a resident expert here in our club uh, who has a wealth of knowledge in currency. Uh, I've asked him to give a program on occupation notes, World War II, and he and Kyle will do a tandem presentation program on this currency series. Uh, we have Mark Clarkson, who will talk about this currency series and his knowledge, and Kyle will start off with the lead. So it's a tandem program. We've never done that before. Let's give it a shot. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, Mark is really knowledgeable about all the currency, and, but pulling things up doesn't really work that well. So, uh, we're working together and uh, putting a PowerPoint together. So, we have it, and I think you'll enjoy it tonight. Uh, it's going to run all about a half hour, but I think you will enjoy it. The time will just fly by. So, you will be amazed what you learn tonight. Now, the Philippines. Uh, was a American possession. And we're going to go from the beginning, 1898 to 1946. The uh, the, the, the two silver dollars, the two pesos, silver dollars, the beginning, and then the, uh, we do go to the occupational notes here, and then we talk about the Battle of Manila, which was very, very bloody at the time of the year of the war. So, and that I will advance it to. We have. Oh, I wanted the one thing. Fourth of July. What are we doing on the Fourth of July? We get drunk and huh? we get drunk. Barbecue. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Barbecue. Barbecue. Yeah. Barbecue. For what? What do we do on, on the Fourth of July? Independence Day. Barbers. Independence Day. Mm -hmm. Independence Day for for the United States of America. Signing of the Constitution. That's right. In 1776. So I want to take you back to the Fourth of July, 1946. That's Independence Day of the Philippines. What happened that day? Come on, let's go. Just like that. All right. It sat for too long. Here we go. After 48 years of American sovereignty, the people of the Philippines assumed the status of an independent nation. The transfer is made on the 4th of July, a day full of significance for these Yanks. Huge crowds jam Manila to watch the birth of the Republic, which regains its independence through the voluntary action of the American people. In a message, President Truman assured our continued support. forward to prosperity. Exceedingly poor after Japanese occupation, the Philippines will receive reparations and free trade concessions from the United States. Manuel Rojas, newly elected to the presidency, takes the oath of office as Ambassador Paul McNutt looks on. An old Philippine resident, General Douglas MacArthur, arrives with a special message. 48 years ago, the mantle of American sovereignty fell over this land and this people. It was the beneficent sovereignty of a liberator pledged to be withdrawn as soon as the well-being of the people would safely permit. America never wavered in that purpose. America today redeems that pledge. This land and this people that I have known so long and loved so well. 1946. Now Mark takes over. Okay, back in the day, 
when the three mics held the club together, I went to a coin shop and discovered a victory note. Before I talk about the victory note, they always remind me, <coughs> buy the book before the collection. So if you're going to collect other than U.S., you may need more than one book for it. <coughs> New books are expensive, but you can buy used copies for five, ten dollars, and you get the same information. It's just the prices are a little bit off. Okay, it's a U.S. Treasury certificate. All of both the silver and the treasury certificates we issued in the Philippines had to be approved by the President of the United States. The portrait over here on the left of, of Mondi, he was Prime Minister of the First Philippine Republic, which really was from the end of hostilities in the Spanish-American War until the Treaty of Paris. I collected national currency. And during the national banking era, there were notes issued in other territories like Puerto Rico, Alaska, Hawaii. Noel brought in some from Indian Territory, Oklahoma, and then the same note in after it became a state. This is the only time I'm aware that the United States itself issued currency in another country. Okay. Yeah, I think that's enough for this part. Okay, on this one, Jose Rizal or Rizal? By the Rizal. 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 Okay. R I Z A I. I do Rizal. not speak Tagalog or Filipino, and I, I have enough trouble with English. <laughs> Rizal. <laughs> Anyhow, in 1892, he organized a, a nonviolent group uh, to promote Philippine independence from. Uh, the Spanish. He, he never held a rifle. He was, he was a nonviolent. Anyhow, in uh, 1896, the Spanish didn't care he was nonviolent. They tortured and executed him anyway. <laughs> keep, keep going with this. The five peso note. Okay. President McKinley. Well, he's on here because he was president during the Spanish American War. What they taught me in history in high school, he was the first presidency that was publicly bought by Rockefeller and Carnegie and Morgan and all that. I mean, that that's my memory. Uh, keep going. Well, Washington, you all ought to know who Washington is. And the mountain is Mount Mayan on Luzon, which I don't always remember. General Lawton. General Lawton was the first military governor of the Philippines. Um, you know, outside of the Philippines, he's best remembered for, he was who Geronimo surrendered to back in 1886. <laughs> Anyhow, as the first military governor for the Philippine insurrection that lasted until 1903, he showed a lot of respect for the Filipino people, and he liked them. And he really viewed it as a youth uprising trying to take advantage of the situation financially. They were doing what the Spanish taught them to do. His successor, Arthur MacArthur, Douglas's father, was the one that really turned it into the moral revolution. We don't need to get into that. But John, I think most people know who Magellan was, he discovered the Philippines. Yeah. In 1946, the Philippines celebrated its independence from Boo. You got Japan, 1945, and the United States, 48 stars, 1946. The first thing you do when you take over an occupied country, you have to establish communication, and then transportation, and then stabilize the economy. So immediately, we overprinted U.S. stamps with the Philippines. Okay, at the end 
of the Philippine insurrection, 1903, we started issuing both coins and currency. The silver certificates, there were series dates 1903, 05, 6, 8, 10, and 12. This particular one is in 1906. Uh, I actually bought it from Bruce Berman. Um, what else do I want to note on this one? I got some. Okay. Seems like there was something I already forgot. They also at the same time produced coins at the time. Uh, we had both the you know, Filipinas on the front, which was the uh, very stylistic uh, Lady Liberty walking in, in the Philippines. The back had the United States of America proudly displayed with its heraldic uh, eagle on top of the shield. These were we, these were minted in San Francisco and uh, Philadelphia, mm. and the, the silver issues were from peso all the way down to the uh, the ten cents. Centavo. Right. Uh, the 90% silver. And then when silver got to be so expensive in 1906, the, the uh, amount of silver went down and the, the, uh, the, the actual silver content decreased. And there. So the coins actually got a little bit smaller. Hmm. Now, the, um, the half, the one, and the five centavos were made out of bronze. Actually, the five centavos was 75% copper. It's like copper nickel we have today. The half centavo was not very popular. It only lasted for two years on that. Um, the picture you see over here is this is a, before he was elected president, that was a Taft on here. He, he was, was a civilian governor. Civilian governor, first civilian, civilian governor of the Philippines. In 1917, there were four notes issued as emergency currency, and that's World War I. The currency really was not issued directly because of the war. The Philippines were drawn into the war only because they were a U.S. possession. And what hurt them the most is our Congress was busy spending money in Europe and other places, and they got a little bit neglected. The Philippines, however, though, uh, yeah, he put a, a note up here. There were 25,000 men enlisted in the National Guard. They never actually did uh, uh, see duty, but they were they were in an American possession. They were not American citizens, but they were still loyal to the United States. Anyhow, there's a one peso, there's a 20 peso, these are kind of out of order. 20 oh, oh, yeah, 20 centavo. We brought this up because in 1916, the Philippine National Bank was created in 1916. It was a government controlled bank. So that's separate from. What do you want me to do? Use the pointer. Not until we get to the main point and the uh, yeah. This is just something to hang on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, okay, the yeah, and then there was the 10 and the 50. The exchange rate was set at two pesos to the dollar. So uh, 10 centavos is worth a nickel. Emergency currency had to be issued in small denominations. The economy over there was so fragile. Was, they didn't have any money. This was a real emergency. Keep going. Okay, starting in 1918, they changed from silver certificates to uh, uh, treasury certificates. Uh, any other notes on here? Or oh, just the series date. There were several of them. 1918, 24, 29, 36, 41, and then the last one, the victory notes are series 66. Okay, this is in here because it's the Bank of the Philippine Islands. This is the bank that grew out of the old Spanish bank. So this has nothing to do with the Philippine Treasury or us. But those notes were around at the time. And they're only honored at that one bank. Right, they're only honored there. And so national currency. Okay, Philippine National Bank. Uh, bringing attention, I guess, to the seals on, on the other one and on this one. 
The Philippine National Bank <coughs> is a government controlled bank. But still, it's not an obligation on the Treasury. Okay. I get the names of the Secretary of the Treasury mixed up here. Secretary of the Treasury McVeigh. His term was 1909 to 1913. He was the first one to propose changing U.S. currency to small size currency like we were using in the Philippines. That got on hold because of the war. It got on hold again in the early 20s because of a lot of political corruption. And then Secretary of the Treasury Mellon in 1925 reintroduced the bill and it got approved in 27 and now we've got 1929 today the same size currency as they use in the Philippines. Those advertising ones are quite collectible. This one's Bank of Italy. I have one from the Treasury. I've got one from another bank back east. But these advertising ones are very collectible. Yeah. Now, I have a little movie here to show you. This is about one minute. The Philippines now has become a commonwealth. <coughs> this is a little. Um, and then collect things that go with it. So you can change the hobby to stamps or the coinage, or later on even the token, even though I didn't get into that in yeah. this presentation. Okay, this is to show the, the difference in the seal. The seal before said government of the Philippine Islands, United States of America. This is a, a 36 note, but starting in 35, they became commonwealth. So the new seal from here on out says, Commonwealth of the Philippine Islands, United States of America. Also notice that this, the seal you had before was Manila, Philippine Islands, and then before after that was Manila, Philippines. Yeah. Mm. yeah the old. Mm. Design changes in the uh, coins happened at the same time. The, uh, the uh, heraldic uh, eagle above the shield was changed over, the eagle was still there, but it was on top of the uh, new coat of arms, the Commonwealth coat of arms. Yeah. And the, uh, that would continue on until 1945. And to honor the, um, the election of President Quezon, they made uh, commemorative coins here in 1936. They had one 50 centavo and two one pesos on there. Total mintage for all three of those coins made 40,000. And a lot of those found themselves at the bottom of Manila Bay during the war. So 40,000 minted, but uh, actual in use today, a lot less than 40,000. Manila in the 1930s was basically like any large cosmopolitan American city. Uh, the chief exports were sugar and tobacco. It's commonly known in certain circles as the Venice of the East, uh, the Queen of the Pacific, or the Pearl of the uh, Orient. This is the Bay Area connection here. The China Clipper, its maiden voyage, November 22, 1935. 
it took off from uh, Alameda Naval Air Station. The Bay Bridge was not, it was in the process of being built, so it was the, the Golden Gate Bridge. It had gained altitude. When it got to the, the, the Bay Bridge, it flew under the support beams, the, the cables. It flew under that. They didn't have enough altitude, so they flew under that. By the time they got to the Golden Gate Bridge, they had enough altitude that they were above the two towers on that. It took five days to go to Manila. The first day, overnight, they went to Honolulu. The second night, they went to Midway. The third night, they went to Lake Island. The fourth night they went to Guam. Wow. The fifth night they went to they got to Manila. Wow. This this is a this is a historic uh, flight. It was our first Trans-Pacific flight. It would open up uh, air, air mail and also a, a passenger service. Pan Am was the one that uh, sponsored this. Philippines was a wonderful place. It was a fantastic place. You want to go? You want to go to the? Uh, uh, the tropics, he went to the Philippines. Then as the 1940s began, uh, Manila was still growing. This picture is showing, this is a very popular uh, bridge, it's called the Jones Bridge in Manila. The building you see behind the big huge building, that's the post office, the huge post office at the time. It was, it was growing, but tensions were mounting. Japan had just signed on with Germany and Italy and uh, the Philippines knew something was going to happen. And something did happen. December 8, 1941. Exactly nine hours after Pearl Harbor was bombed, they bombed Manila. On there. They did a double whammy on that. Manila was bombed, and on December 8, President Roosevelt signed the war powers, declared war on, on Japan. Uh, by Christmas of, of that year, uh, General MacArthur basically, he didn't have enough uh, reinforcements. He asked for a, enough uh, uh, soldiers, he didn't have enough. So basically he said, we, we're, we're, we're leaving. And they said Manila was now an open city, undefended. The Japanese, anyone can come in. They didn't have to bomb. They could just walk on in and take the city at that time, Manila. Uh, the Japanese did bomb Manila at that time. And they took it on January 2nd, 1942, on Manila. And the Mint, that this is actually a, a U.S. branch of, of, in Manila. It closed in 1941, and uh, a lot of the coins were crated and dumped into Manila Harbor, later to be brought up. A lot of them did not, were not recovered, but the ones that were recovered, you know what happens with salt water and silver? Mm -hmm. It gets really corroded, along with bronze. So a lot of those coins were really corroded. So. so what happened that the mint was closed and then the, the minting went back to the United States. Uh, Denver, San Francisco, and Philadelphia. Actually, Denver, if you get like, any of the coins from 1944, 1945, it's most likely Denver. Yes? Yeah, the Japanese used prison labor to bring up a lot of the silver that the US and the Philippine Commonwealth did not recover. We've got a lot of ground to cover before he throws this out. So thank you, Sandra, for yeah. 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 Thank you. I'm sorry. But thank you for interjecting. So the Baton Death March, this is one of the just terrible things that happened at that time. The Japanese knew that they had um, prisoners of war because we basically threw up our arms and said we're not going to do it. So they were planning for 25,000 men. What they actually had was four times more, 100,000 men. And so it took six days to go 60 miles. They didn't have any food or anything. The soldier said, if you stepped out of line, you're gone. If you ask for water, you're gone. If you ask for food, you're gone. So if you don't ask for water, don't ask for food, just keep marching. And hope to God you get there. The 1941 trade commission certificate was the last one issued before the war. And when you go to uh, buy these from dealers, there's some of them that are called aviator notes. The, the Navy asked the Bureau of Engraving and Printing to make up packages that amounted to uh, 100 pesos. 
in the event that some of the flyers got shot down. The only way to distinguish them is by serial numbers. I personally feel the fact that they separate them out by dealers is just another way to run the price of them. Bringing up the subject of the Bureau of Engraving and Printing, the 41s that they issued were all, you know, AU or nice ones. <clears throat> the BEPs always strive for perfection, but they were asked twice by the Army during the war to supply ground troops with well circulated notes. So they took 1936 treasury certificates, they made a concoction of coffee and food scraps and everything else, they threw all these new bills in a barrel and tumbled it for a little bit, and then they eventually made it to some of the ground troops. <coughs> okay, Japanese invasion money. I believe you call it occupation currency. Some of the books refer to it as occupation currency. Most history books and most dealers refer to it as gem notes, Japanese invasion money. Um, all of the ones in the field, well, no. The first issue, all of them will start with a, a block letter of P. The Centavo notes, you can have block letters and fractional block letters. <coughs> there actually is a fractional block letter for a five that's not shown here, but it's in the case. You can keep going. So ten is like that. By the fifty, there were no fractionals; they were just straight. Uh, and, and the second letter, the series would advance. So, you know, where that's a pi, it might be a p, o, m. There, there are other. There are a few eccentric people who want to try to collect one of everything. And the five and the ten. Okay. Then, in 1943, they changed it. The ones have block numbers. And this over here is the Jose uh, Rizal? Rizal. 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 <laughs> Don't throw anything at me. I'm not from the Philippines. <laughs> <laughs> That's a monument dedicated to him. Okay. The five will have a block letter and serial numbers, and the ten will have the same with serial numbers, and the hundred will have like that. Okay, then in 1944 you have inflationary notes. So they went back to just a block letter and, and another one. There's a five hundred and a thousand. Now, in 1945, this note was never issued. Is it a Japanese invasion money or not? This was issued, it wasn't intended to be issued by the second person in the public or the puppet government that the Japanese had installed. They were never issued. They're in, uh, they're all basically specimens. Some don't have the overprint right now. My mind's blank on what that stands for. Yeah, that's uh, yeah. Anyhow, some will have a serial number, some won't. Uh, I have seen these graded on eBay for $399. I've seen them ungraded on eBay. You judge if it's counterfeit, it's $1,000. I've seen them known counterfeit for $15 to $25. I have two. I have this one and I have one without the overprint. Bought them many years ago. Uh, I think I can distinguish the watermark paper on it. Um, I don't know, 50 50 is a counterfeit, 50 50 is not. If it's real, it's worth some money. If it's not, it's still worth something for my collection. Hold it until the end, doesn't it? That means sample of pattern. You can reach out. Oh, that's what it means? Yes. Okay, sample or pattern. That's what it means. That's it. Sample or pattern. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay. After the war, where Jim Nelson literally became worthless, the Philippine people, um, the Philippine government wouldn't give them any for it. The Japanese wouldn't give anything for it. So there was a private organization uh, that went by Jap One Cap that you could uh, give your notes to, get a book entry, 
And they went after the United States government, and they did it off and on for about 20 years. We didn't have anything to do with the issue of the money. We weren't going to honor it. The Philippines said they weren't going to honor it. It just went on and on. Anyhow, there's different types of stamps. This one says uh, compiled by Jap One Cap. The other one is uh, uh, safekeeping. And it says Japanese War Note Associated. I'm always leaving the word out. I can't read it upside down. Is it, is it clear over there? Well, Japanese War Notes Claimant Association. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. The Japanese also issued their own stamps uh, during mm -hmm. the occupation. This is a complete set of the regular stamps. There were uh, semi postal and some official stamps. I didn't want to turn it into a stamp no. presentation. But it's kind of neat to collect. Uh, this was just a map to show the different areas that they occupied. Yeah, you can, other notes were going to be issued into Dutch East Indies, Malaya, Burma, the Philippines, and Ocean. And Ocean, yeah, okay, you can't make that out, but that, that would be Ocean. Oceania would be New Guinea and the Solomon Islands, Guadalcanal in that area. These notes were in here just to show that if were the Philippine notes, the, the block letter started with a P in Malaya, it will start with an M. In Burma, it will start with a B. The Netherland Indies started out the Dutch East Indies. It's referred to in this hobby as the Netherland Indies. Now it's Indonesia, but they start with an S. There was a second issue of these, and this is the only ones that I don't have. These would have been issued in 44 and 45. I don't know the complete story of this, if this is really <coughs> Japanese invasion money or if this was an occupation type of a note because the Japanese were actually encouraging them to become independent at that point. Those are fairly expensive notes. I collect one of these notes. I just haven't. Those are the only gym notes I don't have. Right, right after the war, Dutch East Indies immediately turned into Indonesia. Okay. So if you know Indonesia, that's what we're talking about. Oceania starts with O. The four denominations. We have like half shilling, one shilling, ten shillings, and one pound. The ten shilling is the key to, to the whole set. <coughs> um, fines are $50, very fines are 75 or more, extra fines are 100 and a quarter. <coughs> That's a really tough note. Uh, Actually, anything from Oceania is tough, between humidity and, and that's just another map. But that's one of the Philippines, kind of hard to make out. And yeah, th this map is here but, because we're showing all the providences <coughs> that make up the Philippines. And the reason this leads into the next segment about, um, we just talked about the Japanese invasion money. Now we're going to talk about the resistance, the people that were actually on the Philippine Islands. They were printed their own money in the different providences. So that's why we're, we're putting this this uh, slide up. Okay, <coughs> real money. Bob Loon has reminded us this is a, a magazine advertisement. If a coin dealer can bring drama to a note, he can sell it and get a little better price for it. Under Japanese law, it was legal for the, the military to execute a civilian just for being in possession of these notes. But that was really not the norm. I'm sure it happened. It probably happened a lot. But that was not the norm. Here you go. What the norm was to embarrassment of the Japanese, the economy was so, so fragile and they were doing business 
on all these little fractional centavo notes that were emergency currency. If they took them away from them, now they're going to have to do business in trading you a banana, and I'm going to trade you a half a handful of rice. They couldn't take them away. They would destroy everything. And you can't shoot everybody in the country. There's nobody left to control. So the solution to this is the Japanese took the puppet government, which is really considered the second Philippine Republic, to set up an exchange program. And this really started in 1943. You were supposed to, peasants or slaves, take their notes in, have them registered, and have them put a stamp on it, and then come back in a couple weeks and exchange them for Japanese currency. Well, <coughs> not all of them, or very few of them got registered. A lot of them that did, didn't even get stamped. The, the program was not really successful, even though the Japanese wanted to put out there that it was. It got extended, and then it got extended again. So, yeah, Bob, there were people that got killed for it, but that was not the norm. The Japanese weren't stupid people. They weren't going to kill everybody and completely destroy them. I put in a, a variety of guerrilla currency. The first thing that you want to know is 90% of this is not even guerrilla currency. They're emergency circulating notes that were authorized by President Kassan, Kassan, who was in New York, I mean in Washington, D.C. at the time. Um, different notes, look at the seal. This is uh, one with the Philippine National Bank on it. This one is a Commonwealth of the Philippines on it. Uh, this one's mountain currency. I believe mountain currency might qualify for the global growth. There were at least 40-something, if not 50-something, different issuing agencies. I don't know how to pronounce this one. K? 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 I've got all these notes. I didn't bring them in the case I didn't. Um, these are really crudely printed, and I believe these would have been the ones that were most likely carved out on a little wooden block and printed up in the mountains. These are actual guerrilla. Yeah, so currency. this would qualify as a guerrilla. Payable after the war. Notice payable after the war. Other things that qualified as guerrilla, they refer to pre-surrender and post-surrender. So as a city or a province surrendered, a pre-surrender note might be considered emergency currency. And if it was issued after you surrendered to Japan, a post-surrender, that would be considered resistance. Or any note that was used by the resistance army. Yeah. yeah. OK, and again, the seal. Commonwealth of the seals, United States of America. This is in Mindanao. Mindanao is a southern island area, which Today is still insurrections. When you talk about, when you hear about uh, in the Philippines, you have a lot of fighting going on. Mindanao. It's always been Mindanao. I don't know why. But it's, even back then. Okay. American counterfeit notes. I don't remember the name of the general. It was not General MacArthur. It was a general under him in Australia they got the idea that if we counterfeit notes and flood the Philippines, it'll hurt the Japanese. Well, it's going to hurt the economy and the peasants something terrible, too. So I don't know what MacArthur's feeling <coughs> on it, but he didn't want his name associated with this. It was a general that served under him. I have the 50 centavos, the one and the five peso. Okay. If you look, it's not coming out on here, is it? Okay, it's coming out on here. There's a broken line, which is this area up in here. The counterfeit notes 
there's a little broken line right there, and this is a solid line up there. I have these notes and a cheat sheet up here uh, if you want to come up. With the naked eye, if you don't know what you're looking for, you'll never find it. And even with the naked eye, you might want a cheat sheet and a magnifying glass. Mark told me about this. When we first did the project, Mark told me about this. I, I, I looked at it once, and I said, Mark, I didn't know what you're talking about. I looked at it twice. Mark, I still don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> the third time, we actually got the magnifying glass up in there, and that's you're looking for this this three times area. to see this. Right here on the 50 centavo. It is very minute. It's am it's amazing the difference between the two, but there is a difference. On the one peso, it, there's three balls right there, and there's some little hairs or lines at the end of it. Okay. These two lines right here are clearly separate, where those two lines there are together, and the counterfeit is the ones that are together, and the ones that are separate are clear. When you find these in uh, dealers' boxes, very, very few dealers know about it or will spend the time or the effort to even research it. Okay, now the, the five, that's up these little lines right up in here. These, not the, the outside line, but the one directly above it, it's a clear separate line, and this is a clear separate line, where when you look at the counterfeit notes, the ink all blends them all together. It's amazing. <coughs> so they, they passed easily. It's amazing. You, you, you can't tell. If you didn't know, if you, you couldn't tell. tell. There's no way. I, I take them out and get them mixed up, and I have to get my looking glass out <laughs> to get them back straight in the collection, right? So if you went like that to me, I, I'll figure it out, but it's not going to be quick. All right, Mark. Yeah. Okay, propaganda notes. The code prosperity sphere, meaning Asia for Asia, so that's going to include uh, all of the, the Southern Development Bank note uh, areas. <clears throat> Burma and Malaya and Oceania and the Indies. These were printed on uh, Philippine notes and they were just thrown out of airplanes for the civilians. What is it worth? The Battle of Manila was just, was just amazing when we talked about all the use of these bills, you know, the people behind it, what was happening at that time. Uh, the Battle of Manila was just vicious. Uh, before this, uh, Manila was a um, beautiful city. After this, there was nothing left. It was just, for one month, one month, 100,000 people lost their lives. It just a bloody, bloody, bloody war. The center part of Manila, uh, <coughs> the Japanese were inside there, and they had nowhere else to go. They just burned everything. Just burned everything. And uh, American forces went in, and it was just a bloodbath. Just terrible. These pictures really don't do a service, but it, it shows you a taste of what was happening at that time. Mm. As bloody as Manila was, taking Manila, the harbor was useless until we took Corregidor. Corregidor is a giant rock. The battle of Corregidor was so bloody, you're slipping, you're falling down, the flies got so thick you couldn't see the enemy. It documented. They sprayed that island with EDT twice just so you could see the enemy. So if you think Agent Orange in Vietnam was bad, they're just spraying you with DDT so you can continue to fight. Corregidor is just... After the, after the war, basically, it was useless. So they just flew them. It's all in the street. It's useless. So now we're, we're talking about these notes that were worth some money Fletcher-wise, but at that time, I threw it away. I think we were really close to the end. We're almost there. Yeah, we're just showing the victory stamps Almost there. And we have on the open print, uh, which I thought was pretty neat. I got that set. Okay, do not confuse the victory notes with the Central Bank of the Philippines. The victory notes were issued when MacArthur landed at Leyte, but in July 4th of 46, as they got their independence, we overprinted the back of them. This was to transfer them to the Philippine National Bank. They didn't start issuing new currency until 49. 
I have that set, but we don't need to do that. That was really just to bring it up that you could easily confuse my mind. So in, in conclusion, I, I hope you enjoy this movie. I, I, have, I have one more little slide after this that will give you a taste of what was at that time, the Manila 1930s. But talk about the coins and talk about uh, the currency. You know, coins are just amazing, the, the, the artwork that goes in there, and so is the, uh, the currency. So I, I hope you enjoyed it, and I want to have you just play this one movie. It's three minutes long, and I think you will enjoy it.
Oh. Among older Filipinos who I bet, because I collect Filipino guerrilla money, they referred to the Japanese money as Mickey Mouse money. Yes. That's the way they would call it. Yes. yes. I also know a Filipino, a 10-year-old, who actually lived through the Battle of Manila Bay, mm. left his house with his family as a 10-year-old, and the servant was immediately shot by the Japanese as he was getting out of the house. I won't tell you the rest of the story. So those are the, and the recognized book for authority on Filipino guerrilla money is Neil Scherfer's book, which is about this thing. We just looked up the, on the internet, it's about $200 book. Well, you've got a reference here. The battle in the Pacific made Hitler look civilized. Yeah, really yeah. Good. yeah uh, I wonder why the Philippines Achieved their independence in 1946. Why didn't what happened to Hawaii and Puerto Rico? How come they didn't achieve independence at the same time? Puerto Rico Hawaii Hawaii didn't. Puerto Ricans under the Puerto Rican law of 1900 have 1947 have three options: to become a state, to remain a commonwealth, or to chose independence. Every vote since then has remained a commonwealth. They are declared United States nationals. They can, any Philip Puerto Rican can come clearly to the United States and become a citizen. If you don't believe it, go to the story of West Side Story. They have to come to West the United, United States, States though. They actually just voted to become a state. Now Congress has to approve. Yeah, they have to approve. What so about they, they turn it down because they want government aid. And yeah, once they, they become a state, more. they have to take care of their own people. Hawaii used to be its own kingdom. The America annexed it. You killed most of the world. Don't go there, don't go there. You, it's called the Bandit Constitution. Do not go there. You do talk to old time Hawaiians, boy, they don't like it. Don't go there. That was the first question asked, by the way, as soon as the Spanish American War ended. The, uh, We've got a couple more questions here. I think Tom has one. Uh, to just one comment there. The Battle of Manila never should have taken place. General Yamashita ordered his troops to pull out, believe it is an open city. And his junior officers rebelled. Wow. Is it, that battle should never take place. Wow. Okay. Any any questions mm -hmm. left? Uh, okay, I have to say that these two individuals did an exemplary job yes. Yes. and a most difficult, pervasive, I can put another word in our convoluted topic. <laughs> they included stamps, they included Currency and they included coins. Amen. And, 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 and this was incredible. Amen. 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 like a whole week for you, you know, and all of my presentations take a long time to do, but we're working together, and it took like one solid week to do. I'm the most illiterate person in the room. This is all Carl's production. <laughs> if anybody would like a copy of this program, when there's a program done, we not only video it, but we also keep the, uh, the information on a computer on the file, and I have access. If you want one, send me a note and I'll put it on the zip drive, or you send me a zip drive and I give it to you, okay? Okay, so... Was it um, enjoyable? Was it yes, enjoyable. very enjoyable. Is yeah. anybody going to go out and buy a Philippine note? No. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I got one note. I can sell you some. <laughs> okay, hey, so uh, before we go on break, uh, there's drawing tickets, 50-50, uh, coin, coin show, tickets, tickets coin so show. Please, let's uh, support. Love to do that. And make sure you signed in for attendance if you haven't already. Yeah.